We started the 20th century with Freud's ideas about the effects of early parenting on psychopathology. What Freud did in effect was to put the blame for mental health issues right into the arms of mothers, and this thinking was followed eagerly by the likes of John Watson and Leo Kanner. Mothers became the bearers of guilt for everything from anxiety to schizophrenia to autism and more. As clinicians working with the mental health of babies and children, it's important for us to understand what makes for good mothering. Not only to help parents, but also because these ideas can ensure that we provide our child clients with the containment and attachment they may have missed out on. We also need to beware of getting caught up in ideals that would have us blaming parents for their children's problems, or blaming ourselves for being less than perfect therapists. Personally, one of my greatest concerns in coming to study babies in their early development was that I would leave guilt-ridden from the unwitting damage I'd done to my own children. So it was with great relief that I came to the work of the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott. Here was a post-Freudian who had studied around 50,000 mother-baby dyads in the course of his work as a paediatric psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, and had come to the very refreshing conclusion that mothers do not need to be perfect an idea that I would like to elaborate on today. In this presentation, I will focus on what babies actually need from a good enough mother, why things can go wrong and why this isn't necessarily a mother's fault, and why too good parenting can also be problematic. I hope to show that mothers are not to blame for all children's problems, and that as a society, and particularly as child counsellors, we all have to take some measure of responsibility in helping mothers to be good enough so their babies can grow into well-adapted adults. I'll predominantly look at these things from a psychoanalytic and neuroscience perspective, with a few references to other approaches. The reason I talk about mothers specifically is that the baby's very first relationship in the womb is with the biological mother. Post-birth, we could substitute in father, grandmother, or any other pot potential attachment figures. So when I speak about the care of the baby by mother, this could be any of these alternative caregivers. Anthropological and cross-cultural studies have shown us that psychological health is also possible through multiple caregivers looking after a baby, as in a village that raises the child, although more research into how multiple attachments contribute to mental health is still needed. Even in our individualistic society, the ability of the mother to support her child depends a lot on the ability of society to support her, thereby adding to the idea of the parenting village and further absolving mothers of carrying all the guilt. Before we look at what babies need for healthy development, how do we actually know what good enough parenting looks like? We now have a wealth of empirical research on parenting, including Ainsworth's Strange Situation Test and neuroscientific research such as Porter's Polyvagal System. But our original ideas around good enough parenting come from thousands of hours of observation of mothers and babies by psychoanalytic observers like Winnicott, who took a more phenomenological approach. It was one of Winnicott's colleagues, Esther Bick, who standardised this form of observation into what is now known as the Tavistock Method. This involves an observer visiting a mother and baby once a week for an hour for a period of one to two years. As these observations take place in the baby's home environment, observers are able to see true parenting in its natural environment and not sullied by the unusual lab setups that may influence parental behaviour. Observers do not take notes at the time so they can be fully present with the experience of the baby and mother and tuned in to any transference or counter-transference that comes up. Observers then meet weekly with a seminar group to reflect on the baby's development and relationships and how this confirms or contradicts current understanding. Examples of ideas on what babies need from their caregivers that have evolved out of the Tavistock method include concepts such as attunement, noticing what's happening for the baby emotionally and responding to and reflecting this back, matching a range of feelings with slightly different behaviour that meets the baby's level of arousal. Containment is taking in the baby's unbearable feelings and returning them to the baby in a more digestible form. Holding how the baby is held and handled in such a way that the mother almost blends into the background and becomes the environment that contains the baby and all his or her emotions and experiences. Ideas that have come from lab experiments and neuroscientific research include secure attachment, both Bowlby and Ainsworth ideas around a bond between the parent and child where the child feels safe to explore, trusts the parent to meet their needs and can cope with change and novelty. Sensitive parenting, being aware of and responsive to a baby's needs and emotions. Co-regulation of effect, 
helping children to manage emotions and keeping them in the sweet spot where they're not too aroused or under aroused. Mentalizing is a more cognitive reflection on the baby's internal world of feeling, experiencing and intending than empathy, which is a felt sense of the baby's emotional state. Both these phenomenological and empirical scientific approaches have essentially come to the same conclusion. Babies need a parent who is sensitive to their needs and meets these timelessly, a parent who's aware of the baby's emotional state and can help them to process this until they're able to do it for themselves, a parent who keeps the baby in mind and cares about their experience of the world. Here is an example of an attuned interaction between a mother and her infant taken from one of my own Tavistock style observations. Mum turns Freya to face toward the TV and she starts to bounce her as if she's jumping from one of Mum's knees to the other singing a little made up song. Freya's face lights up and she starts smiling and then breaks into a laugh. She bounces back and forth, arms and legs and head wobbling around. After every few bounces, Mum turns her around slightly just so she can check her level of engagement and then carries on. After a couple of minutes, Freya stops laughing and Mum stops and turns Freya around to look at her. Freya is still smiling and Mum leans in and says, Freya, are you having fun playing bouncy? Notice here how Mum keeps checking on baby's level of arousal and how she manages to stop just as baby's engagement starts to wane, showing both sensitive parenting and co-regulation of effect. Now this may sound like I'm making a case for perfect parenting, but research shows that the good enough parents are only getting this right about 30% of the time, and that is enough. What is more important than getting any of these things right is the noticing of when you got it wrong and then trying to fix that. These mismatches and repairs give babies a model of the world and relationships where things do go wrong, but they can be fixed, and they come to expect realistic relationships in their life where they can trust people to care enough about the relationship with them to sort out any mishaps. Here is an example from the same mother-baby diet where mum is not as attuned to her infant as she was in the previous example. Mum turns around and holds baby up to her own face. Freya turns her head to the side. Mum brings her closer and gives her a kiss and then moves her away, then brings her in for another kiss. She does this a few times. Freya continuously looks off to the left and does not engage. Mum sits baby on her lap facing the TV and they both sink back, mum into the couch and baby into mum and they watch TV. You can see here that mum is trying to connect but is not in sync with where baby's at in this moment. This is not a judgment on mum, but just an example of how even a good enough mother can have a mismatch with baby. Now the majority of mothers are getting this right and most babies tested using the strange situation test are securely attached. Although the operational concepts in this test are debatable when looking cross-culturally and percentages differ across cultures, it still gives us a good idea of general levels of parental competence. So if that's all it takes, why are some mothers still struggling to be good enough for their infants? I really like the way that Hughes and Balin refer to less than good enough parenting as blocked care. There are so many reasons that parents may be unable to provide their babies with the ideals discussed, some of which reside within the child, some that are parent specific and some that are much broader societal issues. Blocked care implies there's something in the way of good enough care, rather than a parent who just can't be bothered or is actively malicious. Here are just a few of these possible blockages. Parenting is not a one-way street. Traits or temperament of the baby, such as an inability to self-soothe, can also affect the parent's ability to connect and form secure attachment bonds. Parents can struggle to connect with a child who they perceive to be very different, for example one that has a disability like dwarfism or deafness. Adoption can create developmental trauma both before birth, as the biological mother rejects the fetus, and after birth, where the baby may have time in institutional or foster care. Probably the main overarching reason for blocked parenting is stress. Porter's polyvagal theory shows that on a biological level, stress can create an inability to connect due to the shutdown of innate connection systems in the body via the autonomic nervous system. Stress takes the prefrontal cortex offline, preventing the parent from managing their emotions, solving problems and resolving conflicts. Stress also reduces oxytocin, which is our main biological hormone of connection. Parents' own attachment issues, as measured by the adult attachment interview, have been shown to affect the attachment style of their babies. 
maternal depression, anxiety, other mental health issues can interfere with the mother's capacity to provide care. There are measurable differences in parents' brains that either facilitate or prevent attuned parenting behaviours. Mentalisation, for example, requires a developed prefrontal cortex. Empathy is greater in parents with a larger insula and anterior cingulate. As you can see, none of these parental issues imply that the full blame should be on mothers. We certainly can't be blaming parents for life stresses, their own developmental trauma or brain differences. Mothers are also part of a much broader system and there are many life factors that play a role in a mother's state and ability to care sensitively for her infant. Stress, for example, can be due to poverty, racism or other forms of discrimination, global pandemics or socio-political events. Broffenbrenner's ecological model of development gives us a model to understand how we are all embedded in multiple levels of systems from the microcosm of the family right through to macro systems such as culture and economy. Any level of this arrangement could be adding to a parent's pressures and ability to cope with their own life and that of connecting to their children. Research shows us that mothers who have the necessary support at all levels of their lives have better attachment and better outcomes for their babies. On the other end of the scale, we find different problems arriving from the perfect mother. Perhaps this is child number four and mum is so attuned to baby's needs she's meeting these almost before baby becomes aware that she has needs to be met. This magical meeting of baby's needs means that baby doesn't get a sense of agency where they become aware of their need, the frustration of not having the need met and what they can do to act on the world to solve that problem. Winnicott went on from his good enough mother to describe what he observed as the effects of too good mothering, where a child would either reject the mother or end up not properly differentiating from her to form his own identity. Babies need closeness with the mother, but also enough separation to be able to know themselves as an individual. Winnicott's observations have been backed up by modern research on mothers and babies. Ultimately, we need our babies to learn self-regulation, and they cannot do this if they don't experience the full range of their emotions. Too good parenting can suppress the feeling and expression of all the emotions by meeting a baby's needs too quickly. Children need to feel and deal in order to fully develop their capacity for self-regulation. A baby who has all their needs met immediately doesn't get a chance to do the interactive dance between parent and child where the baby uses sounds and smiling or anger and cries to find ways to influence the parent. Simple tactics that will develop into interpersonal skills essential for surviving in our very social culture. And speaking of culture, as I mentioned at the start, both parents and clinicians can become overly concerned with parenting practices, and it helps to keep in mind that anthropological studies often do not coincide with what we know to be essential parenting strategies. In many cultures around the world, a baby's immediate needs are met quickly, but other than that, they are often ignored, and anthropological research is not showing detrimental mental health effects across entire tribes due to these practices. In conclusion, it seems that looking at parenting from both Tavistock-style baby observations and empirical studies gives us more than enough reason to put mother blame squarely in the past and for us to collectively use our knowledge and compassion to help in the raising of healthy children. Winnicott said there's no such thing as a baby. I would add there's no such thing as a good enough mother outside of a supportive society. As clinicians in infant and child mental health, one of our primary roles should be to support mothers to be good enough. This is beneficial to mothers and babies, but also to our global village. Secure babies go on to have better academic performance, less mental health problems, less behavioural issues, are less likely to end up in prison or on drugs, and more likely to end up as productive members of society, raising their own securely attached infants. It is time for us to stop blaming mothers and to accept that the good enough mother is also the product of a good enough society that can contain her just as she contains her infant.